Hi, Eric here with 30 by 40 Design Workshop. I just purchased a new toy for the studio, and actually it's not a toy at all. It's a semi-pro level drone. It's the Mavic Pro from DJI, and I did all the research so you wouldn't have to. And I want to use this video to unbox it, to review the specs, to discuss the ways architects can use this emerging technology in practice, and show you how I'm using it. Drones are so interesting to me right now because we're at this inflection point. What used to cost many thousands of dollars, you can now get for less than a grand, and the improvements made in camera resolution and gimbal stabilization have opened up some really fantastic equipment options. So I thought it was a good time for me to buy one to evaluate for the channel, for you all, and for some upcoming projects. And here's what I'm planning to use mine for. First, project documentation, presentation, and marketing. The most pressing need is related to a short film I'm making in the next few weeks, and the drone is an inexpensive way for me to achieve some of the shots I'm hoping to get. But more and more, I'm relying on video to tell the story of architecture. Static images, of course, they're useful, but moving through spaces, mimicking the experience of architecture, it's integral to our understanding of our work. Video is the future of architectural documentation, presentation, and marketing. Small drones like the Mavic Pro I purchased are extremely stable vehicles for capturing video, not only from high above, but also from our eye level, both inside and out. Next, site evaluation. Under this general heading, there's many things drones can do. There's software available today, which allows us to fly patterns over a site to autonomously collect and interpolate topography data. We can create real-time topo maps for export in DXF format, and this is totally possible with the Mavic, a sub $1,000 drone. I mean, that's incredible. There's also sightline analysis. How many times have you wondered what a view was like 30 feet up in the air, or how to design around certain visual obstructions? We can easily do these kinds of things with drones. Now, I'll be using it to aid in site selection and for planning studies. So for example, we could fly proposed approaches or routes to sites or buildings and overlay these on our CAD files. It will also allow us to remotely access hard to reach places or sites, which there are plenty of around here. There's existing building inspections and construction analysis. Roofs, solar panels, facades, chimneys. This is a quick way to access areas that either aren't staged or just too dangerous to get to easily. We even have FLIR or infrared imaging camera options for triaging energy leaks and performing audits in hard to reach places. Of course, there's construction documentation. Many of my clients live far away, so being able to share progress this way keeps them engaged and it will give me a means to discuss project details from afar. Aerial views are just another dimension to capture overall progress on a project. Next up on my list, but perhaps not every architect's, I want to use the drone as an educational resource too. So with the Mavic Pro and the DJI software, I can live stream the feed from the drone's camera directly to YouTube. Imagine the number of people architects can reach this way. Add in VR headsets to the equation, and now we can navigate ancient ruins or buildings we may never have otherwise experienced. Most of you won't visit my projects, but I can bring you along as I experience these places and as the architecture takes shape. It's just an amazing teaching tool. And lastly, there are additional revenue and marketing capabilities of the drone. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to use it this way, but offering the drone as an analysis and collaboration tool with realtors can be a smart lead gen tool. Realtors are right at the top of the new client funnel for, especially for residential architect like myself, and drone imagery can really help sell a property. Tie that in with a critical analysis by an architect, and this might be a good way for architects to speak to and directly help clients as they're considering land for purchase and development. Likewise, this could be a service we offer to contractors to aid in inspections, logistics, and planning, perhaps cultivating another lead gen source. So those are just a few of the use cases I had, and there are of course more advanced use cases too. Think of how urban planners might use it. Traffic pattern analysis, aerial mapping or inspections in disaster zones where it's just too dangerous for people to assess the conditions of compromised buildings. And most certainly in the future, material and delivery and construction via drones will become the norm. Now with so many drones to choose from, how did I select the Mavic Pro? Well, these were my selection criteria. First, 
cost. I wanted to spend roughly a thousand US dollars on the drone and the camera setup. I knew this would take me out of the toy market and ensure I could get a decent camera setup. Now GoPro offers the Karma, which is in a similar price point, but after reading the reviews and digging into the feature set, it felt a little bit like old technology to me. So you can Google around and see what I mean. DJI also has the Phantom 4 Pro for about 1500 and then from there you start jumping up into the really high level, pro level equipment in both size and price. Next up on my importance list was portability. In general, the more portable something is, the more likely I am to use it. The Mavic Pro folds to the size of a water bottle and it weighs 1.6 pounds. So I can grab this quickly and drop it in my shoulder bag or backpack and it's ready to fly in less than two minutes. No cumbersome carrying cases and I don't have to feel like Inspector Gadget when I'm toting it around or prepping it to fly. For me, this disqualified the Phantom 4 Pro. It's just too large. It's more than a carry-on size and it's big, conspicuous, and actually it's pretty loud. Next up for me was a good quality camera. I wanted one with enough resolution that I could use the video for aerial cinematography and to document projects or sites as I talked about earlier. Here again, the Mavic comes out on top for my price range. It shoots up to 4K video at either 24 or 30 frames per second, and it saves it in either MP4 for PC use or MOV for Mac use. Now it only has this 12 megapixel camera, so the Phantom 4's 20 megapixel camera wins here, but as I said, the Phantom 4's size and the higher price tag is limiting. Now the Mavic shoots in RAW and JPEG formats and it includes an onboard micro SD card for capture. Now the lens isn't as wide as many drones, especially the GoPro's Hero 5 camera with the Karma, which tops out at something close to 123 degrees. The Mavic's field of view is about 79 degrees, but I actually think this is a good thing as it eliminates the distorted fisheye effect you often see with drone footage. When you combine this with its ability to shoot in 4K, there's plenty of image resolution to crop in on 1080p, which is the standard HD format, the sort of accepted norm today. The narrower field of view has a more cinematic feel to it as well. If there is a trade-off with this lens, it's the fixed aperture at f2.2. But there are accessories, which I'll discuss in a little bit, which effectively make this a non-issue. The Mavic has a three axis gimbal that keeps everything stable, and I mean rock solid stable, no jello or jitter here, even in really windy conditions. Next criteria was ease of operation. Now I've played with RC toys before, but I'm not a pilot and I've never flown an aircraft. The drone had to be super simple for me to fly so I could focus on operating the camera and capturing images rather than worrying about whether I was going to crash it. Ideally, I wanted something that would fly itself. Now this couldn't have been easier to take right out of the box and fly. And I mean, literally within minutes, I was flying this without any prior training. Baked into the Mavic's controls are a series of intelligent flight modes. These automated options allow you to operate the camera while the drone is either hovering or flying a preset pattern. This is the equivalent of a two operator system where there's a pilot and a cinematographer working together. To do this, the Mavic relies on GPS and GLONASS when you're outdoors, as well as obstacle sensors in the front and bottom to help it navigate and avoid hitting things. Other more expensive drones, like the Phantom 4 Pro, have a more robust set of sensors at the sides and the rear, but again, it comes at a higher price. Lacking these sensors, you do need to be especially careful when you're flying this one sideways and backwards, and especially indoors. You wanna be aware of everything around you. And the last criteria for me was flight time. I didn't wanna be changing batteries every five minutes. I needed something I could launch and maneuver for an extended time frame without having to worry about battery life. Depending on what you're doing, the optimal life of one battery in the Mavic is between 24 and 27 minutes. So hovering in calm conditions gets you closer to 24 minutes, while flying, which is slightly more efficient, will net you about 27 minutes. In practice, I'm averaging about 20 minutes of flight time for each battery before it starts reminding me to return the drone back home. From a portability standpoint, the Mavic Pro is really in a class of its own. As I mentioned, there's the GoPro's Karma and DJI just introduced the Spark, but both are just too much of a compromise in the other aspects I was comparing. Things like the camera, the gimbal specs, and the flight time. 
The Mavic remains at the top of the heap of prosumer drones and the price as a business investment is completely reasonable. Now the drone all by itself is available as of mid 2017 for about $1,000. I purchased the Fly More combo for $1,300, which includes two extra batteries, a charging hub, a car charger, a carrying case, and extra propellers. This is the best value if you're looking to pick up some extra batteries. And once you get your hands on this, I think you'll want extra batteries for sure. Well, let's look at what you get. The Fly More combo comes with three boxes, the carrying case, the Fly More box, and the Mavic Pro box. Opening the Mavic Pro box, there's the remote controller and the body of the Mavic. There's a pretty minimal instruction booklet, a charger and various cables, which you'll use to connect your smartphone to the controller and the propellers. Inside the combo box, there's a four battery charging hub, which will sequentially charge the LiPo batteries, a battery power adapter, two intelligent flight batteries, a car charger, and two extra sets of propellers. The carrying case is well made and at roughly seven inches wide by eight inches tall and five inches deep, it neatly organizes all the gear you need to fly, including the two extra batteries. And it's all in a compact form factor. Now, even if you don't choose to get the Fly More package, you'll want to get at least one additional thing, and that is a set of ND or neutral density filters. With a fixed aperture camera like the one on the Mavic, the only way to control the camera's exposure is by adjusting the ISO or the sensor's sensitivity to light and its shutter speed. So let's say you're outside filming on a very bright day. You have only two variables to tweak. First, you'll choose the lowest ISO possible reducing the camera's sensitivity to light. For the Mavic, the lowest ISO is 100. Then you'll pick a shutter speed which corresponds with a properly exposed image. On a bright day, the shutter speed you'll be forced to choose to properly expose the image will be very fast. Something like 1000, for example. Now this all sounds fine, and it is if you're taking still photos. As long as the exposure is correct, this should result in a sharp photograph. But the problem is when you're recording video, you want your shutter speed to be as close to double the frame rate as possible. Now this is called the 180 degree rule and it's a slow enough shutter speed to blur each image just a tiny bit. This motion blur is what makes video feel natural and cinematic and pleasing to watch. A fast shutter speed makes the video feel very choppy because you're essentially stitching together many very sharp individual images. Now I filmed the side of the studio at the same time of day to illustrate the difference. In one, I used the automatic settings and in the other, the ideal settings following the 180 degree rule. Can you see the difference between the two clips? Which one feels more natural? If I pause the two, you'll know which is which immediately. The blurry one on the left is much more natural looking. So if we're capturing video at 30 frames per second, Ideally, we want our shutter speed to be 60. That's a pretty slow shutter speed, especially for a bright day. If we were to use that shutter speed, our video would be way overexposed. To compensate, we can put an ND filter over the camera's lens, which reduces the light striking the sensor and allows us to get down, if not exactly to 60, at least close to it. ND filters are like sunglasses and their primary purpose is to allow us to alter the shutter speed to achieve certain effects. In this case, a pleasing cinematic motion blur. The video on the left used an ND16 filter to achieve the proper shutter speed and a nice motion blur. I purchased the Polar Pro cinematic filter set for the Mavic Pro, which comes with three filters, an ND8, an ND16, and an ND32. The higher the number, the more light the filter blocks. They easily slip on and off the camera's lens and allow the gimbal to calibrate without any trouble. Okay, so what else do you need to know when you get a drone? Well, here in the USA, you need to be aware of the laws regarding SUASs or Small Unmanned Aircraft Systems. These are set by the FAA and as you might imagine, the rules are changing all the time. So it's best to check with the authority that's in charge of aviation wherever you're located. The FAA publishes a very simple chart describing the rules. Basically, you have to fly during the day, maintain visual line of sight with the drone, keep it below 400 feet and out of controlled airspace yield to any manned aircraft, and you can't fly over people or around wildfires or other designated emergency areas. Now, if this all sounds too complicated, 
there are two things which will help. First, the DJI GO 4 app, which you'll need to operate the drone, uses geofencing to prevent you from venturing where you shouldn't. You should also download the app AirMap, which shows your current location on a map and displays the areas you can and can't operate in around your location. If you're within five miles of an airport with a control tower, you won't be able to legally use your drone recreationally. If you have your commercial drone pilot's license, you'll have to notify the tower when you're operating. Close by a national park like me, can't fly there either. So it's a good idea to understand the restrictions and limitations before you invest. But given how small these drones are and the flight capabilities, like using Wi-Fi to fly the Mavic, means we can fly these inside and document our work like never before. Tons of possibilities for architects, architectural photographers, and interior designers. Now one more thing for US residents. Although I believe this was recently struck down, the FAA's website states that they want you to register your drone with them. So I figured even if it wasn't required any longer that I would still register mine for the nominal $5 fee. So if you're just gonna be flying this for fun and for your own enjoyment, you're using it recreationally. If you're going to use it for profit, then that's a commercial use. If you're flying commercially in the US, you'll need to get a remote pilot certificate. To do this, it's fairly simple. You'll need to pass the section 107 test. You'll have to study the materials, know the rules and regulations, which makes sense anyway, and when you're ready, pay a nominal $150 fee to take the test and hopefully receive your pilot certificate. From there, you can put your drone to work for your business. Now let's talk about some of the essential apps. Before you can fly, you'll have to download the DJI GO 4 app to control the drone and the camera. Also, download AirMap, as we discussed previously, to help you determine the flight restrictions nearby. Then there are weather apps. Because you can't fly in high wind, rain, snow, or foggy weather, a real-time weather app like UAV Forecast is helpful. It also tells you how many satellites are overhead and how many you'll be able to lock onto. And lastly, I think you should pick up an app like Sunseeker or Sun Surveyor to help you plan where the sun will be with respect to your site or building. This is also a good one to have for your design work too. So that's an overview of the Mavic Pro. If you can't tell, I'm really loving this thing and I'm looking forward to showing you how we're putting it to use in our upcoming film and perhaps we'll use it to live stream from one of our projects in the near future. Until then, please hit the thumbs up below if I've helped you in any way and leave a comment. It helps me grow the channel. Are you ready to pick up a drone for your creative work? What uses have I left out? Cheers.